It's not going to be just me up here on, on stage. I should be joined in a second by Anu Bradford online, and I'll try and speak to you. There she is. Hi, Anu. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning to you, Anu. This is, this is what tech will do, right? It will make you participate in conferences before breakfast because Anu is speaking to us from the East Coast of the United States. So thanks very much for doing this. A very warm welcome once again to the first Spotlight Talk of the conference. And again, thanks very much to Stormy Mildner and the entire Aspen Institute team for providing such a great stage for, for debate. And I think there's lots of room and need for debate. Uh, my name is Tobias Endler, as I already said, I'm a political scientist and, and an author on transatlantic relations and democracy and debate in our time. For the next half hour, and this is all we have really, we'll try something that cannot be done, uh, Anu, I think you agree, and that is covering a very complex issue that is evolving as we speak in all of 30 minutes. So I think I always knew there was a reason why Ambition and Aspen both start with the letter A, and this is, this is what we're trying to do. The good news you can see up on the screen, Anu Bradford is the ideal guest who joins us in this undertaking today. So let's enter again, let's enter a round of applause across the Atlantic, shall we? Good morning again, Anu. Uh, let me introduce you just quickly to the audience before we get going. Anu Bradford is Henry L. Moses Professor of Law and International Organization at Columbia Law School. She is the director of Columbia's European Legal Studies Center and a senior scholar at the Jerome A. Chazen Institute for Global Business at the Columbia Business School. In addition, Anu is also a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's a native of Finland. Her expertise also includes practicing law in Brussels as well as serving as an advisor in the Parliament of Finland and the European Parliament. So there couldn't be any, any better guests that I can think of. Professor Bradford's research focuses more currently on international trade law, European, European Union law, and comparative and international antitrust law. Her book that came out in 2020 was called The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World. So, Actually, quite a provocative title to start us off with. And Anu has a new book that's coming out this fall, which I could very much recommend to all of you, titled Digital Empires, The Global Battle to Regulate Technology. And we'll hear more about the central ideas of the book in a second. So let's jump right in, not waste any time. Anu will give a short talk, introducing some of the central ideas of her new book. Possibly we'll also touch on the Brussels effect. Uh, and uh, some of the new ideas might, might concern the main approaches to regulating tech around the globe, obviously in the United States, in the European Union, and also in China for all, for all matters. Some of the challenges that come up along the way and how they could be solved, and obviously which approach might come out as the winner uh, in the end. And then possibly also why it's a good idea to have more cooperation between the EU and the US, as was just said by Clark Price, uh, to have more cooperation, not less, when it comes to regulating tech. After Anu's talk, there will be a little bit of room for us up here on the stage in conversation to dig a little deeper, maybe. But for now, Anu, we're all ears, eyes and ears, and the floor is yours. Welcome again. Thank you so much, Tobias, for that kind introduction, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I, I really wish I could be there in person. Uh, Berlin is one of my uh, favorite cities, and uh, I always would welcome the opportunity to, to join you there in person. This is a terrific set of conversations that you have lined up, but thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a part of that conversation with you. So let's indeed talk about technology and the regulation of technology. So I would say that in today's conflict-ridden world, where the governments don't really agree on anything, there still seems to be an emerging consensus that big tech is a problem and technology needs to be regulated. But there is no consensus in how we ought to be regulating the large tech companies. And I would say that we have three basic models to think about tech regulation, and they revolve around the, the ideologies and approaches of the United States and China and the European Union. 
So these three, what I call digital empires of the modern era, because of their influence and ability to really shape the global digital order, they put forward a different model on how to govern technology, each focusing on prioritizing differently the relative role of the markets, the state, and individual and collective rights. So first thing I want to highlight that public conversation often really talks about just US-China tech war. There's this obsession of who wins the tech race. But to me, that is only focusing on one piece of the ongoing technological contest. There is also a contest over the rules that govern the entire tech world. So let me quickly introduce what I call these three different models, the American market-driven model, the Chinese state-driven model, and the European rights-driven model. So the American model centers on this idea that we need to protect free speech, free markets, and free internet. It is a techno-optimist vision that traditionally has really placed its faith in tech companies, self-regulation, and the markets, and has been very skeptical of government intervention. China, on the other hand, it is a state-led effort to turn China into a technological superpower. At the same time, the Chinese state-driven model is really focused on entrenching the control of the Chinese Communist Party so that there's political control over the Chinese citizens, exercised through surveillance, censorship, and propaganda. The European Union, on the other hand, I call that model a rights-driven model. It is a human-centric, rights-centric, fairness-driven way to think about a more redistributive, human-centric digital economy, where there is a greater faith in state intervening in an effort to protect those individual rights and redistribute power in the digital world. So these models are not even limited to what China does in China, the US does in the US, or what Europeans do in Europe. Instead, all these digital empires are actively exporting their regulatory models. But they're exporting something different. The US is exporting the private power of its technology companies. China is mainly exporting infrastructure power by building digital networks and other hardware around the world. And the Europeans are exporting their regulatory power. That is something that I had written previously about the Brussels effect, the European Union's unilateral, unilateral ability to regulate the global marketplace. So that already tells us that we actually have overlapping spheres of influence instead of the world really splintering or balkanizing. There's many battleground states that, are, that see themselves using Chinese hardware, American software governed by European rules. But that also then leads into the contestation uh, because these models are overlapping in the global marketplace. So what is the battle between the, the three digital empires about? It is the battle for technological power, economic power, political power, military power, and also cultural and ideological power. It is a clash of systems that represent different visions for the world and sets of values and rules that, that govern pretty much every aspect of our digital society. So this battle to me takes uh, place at two levels and that to me helps us really understand what are the main issues we focus on when we think about global digital regulation. There's a horizontal battle and there's a vertical battle. The horizontal battle is the battle that is emerging between the US and China and, and the, uh, the EU. The US-China battle is mainly a battle for technological supremacy and really characterized by the, uh, the increasingly heated tech war. But there's also a transatlantic battle, which is mainly a regulatory battle. It is conflicts about privacy and surveillance about digital taxation, about antitrust, where the stakes are really defined differently with the Americans thinking about European regulators overreaching, whereas Europeans often think about American tech companies overreaching. But those are some of the major horizontal battles that are unfolding. But there's also a vertical battle as each of these digital empires are trying to regulate their tech companies or tech companies of other digital empires. 
And this vertical battle is particularly intricate for two different reasons. So one is that these governments have a complicated relationship to the tech companies. These tech companies are the target of the regulation, but they're also tools that these countries need in their battle for technological prominence. So you cannot intervene and regulate them so forcefully that you weaken them in a way that you can no longer fight your horizontal battle. But also then there's an other intricate issue in the vertical battle that these tech companies need to navigate multiple masters. They need to face at the same time the Chinese state-driven model in China, whereby the Americans say that you should not be engaging in censorship. And China says, if you want to operate in our market, you do engage in censorship. So ultimately, the future of the digital order will be defined by these different digital battles. And I think these battles are really characterized by the mix of conflict and restraint. There's restraint because, for instance, America is very keen on limiting exports of technologies to China. But it also does not want its companies to forego all the economic opportunities in the Chinese market. These, these economies are, are intertwined in a way that it's very difficult for companies like Apple to completely disentangle itself from the Chinese market. The same way that there are regulatory battles across the transatlantic uh, domain, but at the same time, the U.S. does not want to accelerate those battles to the extent that it prevents its ability to collaborate with the Europeans when it comes to a joint effort to restrain the influence of China. So we see both elements of conflict and elements of restraint. But let me now go into something that Tobias already indicated that you might be interested in who, which model is going to prevail. So if we predict into the future. So let me offer a couple of thoughts. So one is that I am increasingly confident that the United States market-driven model is losing. There is very little support anymore to this idea that tech companies can self-govern that we do not need governments uh, to intervene. So the world is turning away from the American market-driven model. Even the voices in the United States, whether you look at public opinion surveys or the conversations in the US Congress, they are turning much more skeptical of these techno-libertarian foundations of the American digital economy. It seems to many that the US got more than it's bargained for with this section 230 of the Communications Decency Act that is basically the foundation of free speech online. What we have today is techno-libertarianism gone wild, causing havoc around the world, while also shaking the foundations of democracy in the United States itself. So instead of tech companies delivering freedom and, and really strengthening democracy, we see individuals stripped of their dignity and personal autonomy and being surrounded by hate speech and disinformation online. So there is pressure from Europe, from uh, 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 I apologize, American citizens for the US government to do something, to be more like Europe in terms of regulating technology companies. But even if the discontent and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the tech companies is real, the dysfunction of the US Congress may be even more real. And to date, we still do not see a lot of tech regulation emerging from the United States. So if the US model is not doing well, I actually think the European model is doing relatively well. So in the democratic world, there is an increasing consensus that the European regulatory model best serves public interests, checks corporate power, preserves democratic structures of the society. So we see countries around the world emulating the European regulatory architecture. Even the US, as I mentioned, is now rethinking its techno-libertarian foundations. And with every privacy scandal, with every um, uh, uh, hate speech candle on, online, there seems to be the European model being vindicated in the eyes of the, the citizens. But even if the European model is doing well, I have three main concerns about the future of the rights-driven model that the Europeans are both endorsing at home and exporting abroad. So first, there is a concern whether that model is consistent with innovation and technological progress. I always get the question, 
Can Europeans ever generate technologies or they can only regulate technologies? And here I've written a lot about regulatory power and I think it's real power, I think it's relevant, but I'm also very quick to admit that it's not enough that Europe regulates and it's content and being referee. It needs to get on the field and play the game, play offense and play, play defense and be also a, a, a hotbed of technological innovation. So many suggest that the EU cannot, uh, cannot innovate because it regulates. But here, I don't think it is inherently a problem with the European pro-regulatory approach that it would be incompatible with innovation. Regulation is not the reason why big tech companies don't emanate uh, from, uh, the, from the EU. I rather think that there is an other set of issues, lack of integrated digital single market, lack of uh, deep integrated capital markets, punitive bankruptcy laws that deter risk taking, very different from the United States. That is a foundation for the entrepreneurial spirit and technological disruptive innovations. And the Europe's inability to harness the global talent the way that the United States has been are able to do. So yes, Europe regulates more than the United States, but all these other factors to me are the ones that really set the US and the EU apart. So in many ways, I think the EU emulating European privacy laws, European approach to content moderation, European approach to antitrust law, but I would not mind the Europeans emulating the American entrepreneurial spirit, the culture of risk-taking, the bankruptcy laws, the capital markets, the, the role of venture capital in general, um, and uh, one of my favorite topics, really proactively to try to become, uh, make Europe a destination for global tech talent. So my bigger concern about Europe's rights-driven model is that it is prevailing as an ideology, but Europe's track record in entrenching that model into actually implemented outcomes is very weak. So the Europeans have not been as successful in enforcing uh, the rights-driven model. So if you look at the GDPR, the, the flagship of European regulation, there were reports in 2021 that the Irish Data Protection Agency, that is the main enforcer due to the headquarters of many uh, the leading tech companies being in, in Dublin, that about 98% of the complaints pending before the Irish agency were still unresolved. So enforcement is one of the biggest challenges. So ultimately, if Europe fails to enforce, it can win the battle of ideologies, but it's the US model that prevails in practice. We do have techno-libertarianism. We have tech companies governing the world because Europe is not capable of enforcing its regulations. So rather than worrying about over-regulation of the Europeans, I think the Europeans should double down and follow through and actually enforce their regulations. I, at the same time, it's very easy to criticize, but let me be clear, enforcement is very difficult. I, I saw the statistics that has really stayed with me, that the year when I just criticized the Irish DPA for not being able to enforce, when the GDPR entered into force, the Irish agency was vested with the budget, annual budget of 9 million. That's the same amount that the biggest US tech companies headquartered in Dublin, make every 10 minutes. So they have a big opponent to fight their legal fights against. Second, it is easier for China to regulate technology. Europe works with the rule of law and democratic constraints, which makes uh, regulating technology much harder. And if you also just think about the domain of regulating these companies, in 2020, there was these statistics I looked at that Facebook users were uploading 150,000 photos every minute. The YouTube uh, videos, they were again 500 hours of video uploaded every minute. There is no way that some European regulator is ex ante reviewing all this material and effectively regulating it. So at the same time, when I call for more enforcement, I recognize some challenges associated with this enforcement. But let me now focus on, and I'm going towards the end, the, the third and to me the biggest challenge. I say that the European model is doing well in the democratic world, but it is facing a big battle against China because also China is doing very well. There's tremendous demand for Chinese state-led governance, especially in the authoritarian world. And if you look at the map of the world, 
the world is increasingly turning authoritarian. It's hard for us to see from Berlin and New York how much our role in the political map of the different regime types is shrinking. And, and it's hard for us anymore, even if we can make a normative case about the, against the Chinese model as being too oppressive, it's hard to predict its demise in practice. China, Chinese model is doing very, very well. So that's what I see as the defining battle that now is characterizing the digital economy. The one between the more European style, a democratic governance model that is increasingly embraced by techno democracies and the more sort of Chinese led techno authoritarian camp that is having a very different vision for the digital world and the relative role of the state and the individual rights. And ultimately, what is the stake in this battle is the future of liberal democracy. And I think this future for the liberal democracy, democracy can in that battle be lost one of the two ways. So one is if the US and the EU lose the horizontal battle to China. And ultimately, technology will be harnessed to further the goals of the state, as opposed to empowering the individuals and protecting their rights. Second, Democracy is also lost if the US and the EU lose their vertical battle to tech companies. At that point, the individuals are being exploited by tech companies as opposed to protected by democratic governance. And here I also would pause you to think about for a moment. If you predict the outcome of the vertical battle, few of us are predicting that China will lose its battle vis-a-vis -vis its companies. But we are less certain if democratic governance like those in the United States and Europe can prevail in their own vertical battle vis-a-vis -vis tech companies. So what does that tell you? That the digital world is either governed by authoritarians or tech companies because we fail to show that there is a democratic way to govern technology. That is the outcome that neither the United States nor the European Union wants to see. And to me, that is the biggest battle cry around which the US-EU cooperation ought to be built. Yes, there are differences when it comes to the values of the United States and the EU, but when it comes to the biggest battle of all, the US and the EU ultimately see very much eye to eye. And I see that the US is already moving in many ways closer to the European view that technology needs rules, but even the greater impetus for transatlantic cooperation and institutions like the Trade and Technology Council is the idea that the US and the EU need to join forces. And the biggest choice for me is not for Europe to choose between the US and China, but it's for the US to choose whether to join forces with Europe or whether to let China win. And this battle for the future of the liberal democracy is the battle that I don't think the US or the EU are prepared to lose because ultimately, if they lose that, what else there is for them to fight for. So let me end with that, Tobias, and, uh, and answer any questions you may have. Well, I think I can speak for all of us, Anu. Uh, thanks very much for a fascinating and a very thought-provoking talk, which is, which is all we need at the beginning of a conference like this. Everybody leaves with different ideas. Uh, I was fascinated by the battle of digital empires, as you, as you laid it out. The United States being a single sovereign nation, China being a single sovereign nation, and the European Union obviously being not. So, so I would be very interested if you could dig a little deeper. You mentioned the issue of integrated single markets, for example. Uh, our conference today is called the German-American Trade and Tech Dialogue for a reason. So I would be very interested in just if you could explain a little more, you know, the categories you choose and what exactly the big advantage is that you see about the European Union as opposed to something that would sort of keep it back from moving to the forefront. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, I guess what, what I, uh, why I chose the three big digital empires is to have this starting point that the world is focused on US-China as the biggest technological powers. And I think that's very understandable if you just look at the list of the leading tech companies, where are the biggest AI startups? Those two are really uh, clearly players in that game. 
But the European Union is in many ways much more influential in shaping the global environment within which technology is evolving. So I would defend Europe's place there. But you also note how Europe is not sovereign. So it's a different kind of empire. It's the empire that is not as united, single entity. And I think that is the weakness and the strength of Europe at the same time. It can be a weakness. Uh, for instance, the lack of integrated digital single market is a very concrete impediment to European technological development. So European startups need to internationalize much earlier than the American counterparts that can basically uh, first grow within a very integrated American market. So there's no question that in order to become a technological powerhouse, the EU should be drawing on its biggest asset, which is the single market, and which still remains incomplete when it comes to digital regulation. So yes, there the, the, the fragmentation can be a weakness. But in many ways, the idea that the European regulations emerge from this contestation across 27 different member states. That can often make those regulations better, more balanced, because they reflect already the kind of contestation and differences and compromises reached across the member states. It's one of the reasons why they have been replicated and emulated by governments around the world, because by design, the European regulations have been drafted in the way that they work in different legal systems. And that makes them better fitted for many other uh, legal systems around the world. And here, for instance, if you look at uh, the different balancing that Germans bring to the conversation, the very strong pro privacy rules, the French bring into the conversation, well, we also need to think about national security and surveillance. We know what terrorism is like. We do believe in privacy, but there needs to be some kind of a con uh, the, the balance there. Again, if I use German's approach in the, the preparation of AI regulation, again, much more sensitive on the protection of fundamental rights. Then comes Finland and the other Nordics who are bringing the voice that we also need to think about innovation very strongly. So in many ways, I think there is a they checks and balances that come from these different conversations where the different voices are very, very strong. The one internal contestation, and I, I just can't help but bring it now, is this obsession with digital sovereignty and technological sovereignty. And that is, I think, an important way that we see where the European model is heading and how much Europe might be sort of shifting in its own sort of concept of what kind of digital world it is building because it seems to be increasingly focused on the kind of more techno protectionist ideas. And that's something that also gives me pause and an additional challenge that I think I'm increasingly focusing on as well. And then we'll, we'll have to wrap things up, unfortunately, already. You, so you made a very strong case how Europe can become a powerhouse of its own. And you said in, um, before that the U.S. already is, obviously, but then you said something very fascinating. You said the U.S. model is losing at home, in a way. It's losing acceptance among the population, uh, among lawmakers, possibly, who want to rein in big tech and so on. But still, you said the U.S. model is prevailing in practice. So, so you made it sound like there might be something of a watershed moment where things you know, go one way and then go the other way. So for us in Germany and Europe, as we look at the United States and possibly our own future, as in where things are going, could you talk a little bit about that, that, that watershed moment where things go like from prevailing in practice to losing in acceptance and what this might mean for where we are going as, as Germany and the European Union in this respect? So I think it is a very unfortunate state of the, the, the affairs where you have had an ideological consensus the kind of values have converged around the, an idea, but the governments fail to deliver that in practice because that leaves citizens discontent. They understand their privacy is being violated, yet they realize that their governments have been unable to protect them from uh, those, those violations. Um, and uh, the idea that they are buying into this idea that the tech companies are becoming too powerful, yet they do see their dominance just being entrenched and entrenched and, and the governments being unable to do anything about it. So there where there's a gap between where societal consensus is and the, what the governments are able to deliver, it also shows to those battleground states that are choosing between a European model or the Chinese model, is that do we want to be dragged into these legal fights that we seem to be constantly losing against these companies? 
or do we have more of an authoritarian model that seems to be effective? There is no gap between the, what the government wants, what it promises and what it delivers. And in many ways, I think that's that's why that the stakes in the Europeans now being able to show that the DMA and DSA, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, the, the forthcoming AI Act are not just strong on paper, but they really show how there is an ability by democratic governments to actually entrench those into concrete market outcomes. And ultimately, I think that would leave both the U.S. discontent if the U.S. is prepared to move towards the Europe, Europe discontent, because if you just win the battle of values, you can say that I was right. But it doesn't leave you very content if you say that I don't have the government that is able to deliver what is right and what the citizens need and what the citizens want. So ultimately, I think that would be a very unfortunate, uh, unfortunate outcome. I haven't lost my faith. I think the governments are acquiring new tools. It helps that they have the public support now to do that and that the consensus and the momentum is on the side of the governments to do that. And I think the consensus is also shifting in a way that the many of the tech companies also realize that they need to pick their battles. They cannot be fighting the governments when there are more governments fighting them and they cannot, cannot be at the same time fighting antitrust and copyright and privacy and content moderation. And ultimately, I think we need to also understand what society wants from them, what they want from technology, uh, technology companies, and what is the role and responsibility of those companies to help be governed and jointly govern and work with the governments in a way that ultimately technology serves us um, as citizens and as individuals. Technology serves us in the best of senses with, you know, the two of us and the, the entire audience being in touch across the Atlantic. You as someone who hails from Europe, who lives and works in the United States and who cares so much about transatlantic relations and moving forward together. So it's been a, it's been a pleasure, Anu. I think, uh, I think I can speak for all of us. You spark a lot of thoughts. I can see in people's faces in the audience that people will take along uh, a lot of thoughts and ideas as we go about our conference. So thanks very much for for doing this before breakfast, as I, as I said, and for joining us online. Let's have a big round of applause for Arno Bradford again. Thank you. Thank you so much to be us. Thank you, everyone. It was really a pleasure, and I, I wish uh, a tremendous set of conversations. You have an exciting agenda, and, uh, and all the best for the conference. Thank you for joining. Thanks very much. Check out, check out her new book, Digital Empires, as it's coming out this fall. And make sure to also read The Brussels Effect, which, again, just the title alone, I think, is very promising and thought-provoking. Thanks very much, everybody, for this, and enjoy the remainder of the day. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>